you're going to be the number one guinea pig because, okay, it's like you decided to go into that relationship. Well, you're going to understand something about your psychology and the other person necessarily because you did. Yeah. But if you don't, you'll never learn anything and you'll just be, okay, you, you'll be afraid and locked in your house for the rest of your life and you'll die there. Welcome to the Yoga Better Podcast. My name is Andrew Ducom. Today's interview is with the most important yoga teacher from the U.S., that you've never heard of. And the case could actually be made the most important yoga teacher in the U.S., period. If you live in Houston, Texas, you know who I'm talking about. His name is Robert Bustani. If you live in Houston, Texas, and you did not know this, you live in the best yoga city in the country, and I'll actually argue the world. The creativity, the diversity, the freedom to create, the multitude of styles, focuses, and since 1969, there's been a guy teaching who, like me, has kind of a commitment to not be uber famous, but rather to teach and work more than he sells. He is the source of a few famous styles that you have heard of that were lifted basically directly from his classes in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. If you travel around the world looking for or diverse, interesting, informed, creative, and and sort of a surprisingly confident practice, you're going to be disappointed. And it's really people that start in Houston and then move somewhere else, which is actually very, very common. Houston is a place where people move to and then move back away. So people try new things. And then you try to recreate that in any other city. You're not going to be able to do that. And it's my perspective that it really has to do with this one guy that we're going to talk to today. He is my teacher. I was super lucky to have my very first yoga class with this guy. If you take a class from him, you will absolutely hear at least some similarities to the Yoga Better style, because of course we are on Robert's lineage. His style is Pralaya Yoga. You'll hear some interestingly non-Yoga Better language, but most importantly, I think in introducing you to Robert, if you've never heard him before, I hope you can hear the love in his heart. Robert saved my life, and in some very important ways, he gave me my life. And yes, the practice I do now, and the perspective I take now, looks different than the perspectives and practices he gave me all those years ago. And just like in our teacher training, it really is the thinking that set us free. Thank you, Robert. It's not like I'm standing on your shoulders, because, you know, I wouldn't be able to see very far. You're not, you're not that tall, but it's more like you provided this pad that we could all launch ourselves from. And even all those people that don't give you credit, I hope you know that we're grateful. You set the world free. Houston and the world is a better place for the work you did. So, you know, don't stop. Keep it up, brother. This is a sweet little episode full of silliness and punnery and occasional dips into serious, high-stakes yoga stuff. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's go ahead and get started. Andrea, 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 Andrea. Welcome to Hey Andrea. It's where we talk, talk to Andrea. My favorite, sometimes after it's just rained, I'll be walking and I'll get to like the end of the ditch and I hear, what? <laughs> it sounds it's like so loud. Uh-huh. A little frog is got scared. Bloop. It is so high pitched. Mm-hmm. It makes me laugh every Look time I jump. Oh, Hurricane wow. Nicholas. Jolly Hurricane Nicholas. Your wind's coming our way. Likely you will drop a lot of rain before your stay is over. <laughs> we will be so very glad when you are done. And then we will jump and play outside in the sun. <laughs> so when I was a little girl, there had been bad weather one day and someone said there was a tornado and so I had an idea of what a tornado was but then Sorry. Hurricane Alicia, of course you're a kid, you, you only know what you know and yeah. I've never seen a tornado so in my mind how I envisioned tornadoes were big, very angry and upset tomatoes and there was like a real big one that sort of like don't like <laughs> hopped in the middle of the street and there are a bunch of little bitty ones uh-huh. and what the bigger ones would do is that they would take the little tomatoes and they would throw them at the window and if they saw you peeking out the window they would come and get you and i was so scared of hurricanes slash tornadoes slash tomatoes they'll be coming across the ocean when they come it's the gulf they'll be coming across the ocean when they come it's the gulf of mexico they'll be coming across the ocean they'll be coming across the ocean they'll be coming across the ocean when they come they'll be dropping tons of rain on us when they come water is heavy They'll be dropping tons of rain on us when they come. Ouch, it's heavy. We'll be splashing in the water because we cannot get out of our houses because everything floods when it rains just a little bit. 
Thanks for suggesting we walk tonight. Oh. Did you see my face light up like a Christmas tree? I did. The sun is hot. It's impressively hot. I'm hot. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not. And if you want to hang with me, just give it a shot. Stop that. Mm-hmm. Stop that. Mm-hmm. Name that rat. The other day, I was playing kind of in the yard with the kids, and I had to get a ball or something. And when I walked back to the house, I crossed the front yard, mm -hmm. and I ran into a spider web. <laughs> And the spider web was so strong. It felt like boing, like I bounced <laughs> off of these spiders. It boy, you're going it boy, I was I was able to feel it like <laughs> reverse. That was silly. podcast yeah several times I figured you know there's a million things we can talk about one of the things i was excited about is capturing our chat conversations more than like a teacher training okay you can do whatever you want did you have any ideas for things you want to talk about no oh, tons of things okay we could start practical okay so one question i had for you sure <laughs> that's always good i always respond well to questions <laughs> So I think a really helpful tool that people can do is um, we talked about lineage before at the little meeting we had, you know, that I'm a big fan of lineage and acknowledging, you know, where ideas came from. I made a big list of all the stuff that you've contributed to yoga generally and, of course, the yoga scene in Houston. And one of them was, OK, the freedom to sort of be creative. I call it apostatize yourself from the church of there's just this way to do it. So they're like you're free. This is you get to, you get to create it. And I don't know that you would have say it this way, but. All this stuff was made up by somebody at some point. Let's contribute <laughs> to sure. it. And even realized beings that I've met will tell the same thing. They said one old guy, and that's the guy that lived on half a couple of vegetables a day uh -huh. and slept two hours a night. Wait, so a half he, a couple, so just one vegetable? Yeah. Well, <laughs> and frozen vegetables sometimes. Oh, was, wow. He said if you, yoga is not complete. So if you notice something, you can do it. But everything, even, okay, why are we going to quantum computing? Well, we're going to quantum computing because you have to have an iterative process to solve complex problems. Right. That's why AI, whether you're afraid of it or not, whether whatever it is, you have to have an iterative process. It becomes a little more interesting if I teach something to an individual and then that individual with their full experience of life in a variety of ways and unique genius, because each person has some kind of genius, takes that, well, they might discover something that I missed, or they might enhance right. something. So the idea is we not only iterate on what we learn, but share it with others, and those iterations go on. And some of it's going to go wrong. <laughs> we know it's going to go wrong. And that's, that's understandable. I mean, you can just look around the world and, yeah, okay, things are going wrong. What's, what's important, we know from chaos theory that there will be some order that will spontaneously show up. The Himalayan monks that I work with, they put it very well. They said, okay, we have no successors. You know, I was, of course, concerned about that. And, you know, they said, oh, that's happened many times. Don't worry. It always comes back. And so what happens? Life disappears from some particular body and then some other child is born and just like a radio might pick up a given frequency this child is born and the child might have certain receptivity and pick up something that's just floating in the ethers and all of a sudden they turn out to have this beautiful expression of yoga that's maybe never been before and I've had those experiences. Other people, of course, have had those experiences. The knowledge will hold. And the thing is, as you train a student, can you get them to a place where their receptivity opens up to such an extent and they become so absolutely themselves that the knowledge from inside might challenge the assumed traditional 
knowledge on that side, but those two things have to converge eventually. They have to. There's no avoiding it. It may take a while. Right. And that's why they... And people will be upset in they, the meantime. They talk all... <laughs> the, you know, and, and what happens is, okay, if somebody gets upset with you, okay, what's going to happen? Well, okay, you're going to grow, and sooner or later, they're going to grow. Right. And... Or, you know... Regardless of how... Or, <laughs> or, or, you know, there's obituaries. Those help, too. Well, there, there are obituaries. That is, that is true. That's a certain grace. So I've heard this is an argument against religiosity for science, except it's really just for what is true. If you take all of human knowledge and all the books that have ever existed and you destroy them, in a hundred or a thousand years, all the mathematics that's been created, all the scientific research, all that study, that will be recreated. Absolutely. But all of the weird stories about X, Y, and Z, the truth of them will exist, but, you know, okay, maybe there won't be Krishna telling the story, but it'll be something, some something kind of truth. Always happens. Yeah. Except for me, the liberation of being in your class was always the freedom to look inside rather than, you know, some people might argue with you, but you've always been very clear you were never a guru. You Absolutely. Never, you never seek, sought that. Although, you know, if somebody massaged your feet, you'd be okay with that. <laughs> 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 yeah, sure. That'd be, that'd be okay. I could eat so. I'm, yeah. I'm a tolerant person. Yeah, very, very generous and sure. kind, benevolent. But we we were free to create, and you, as the leader of the style and the class and the and all the trainings and the the guy with the most experience, still always questioned the people in the room. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And so, if you don't pose as the ultimate resource, and there's space for other people to actually ask, well, how can I contribute? Then it is more like a, a collective brain, right? There is a brain trust. There is, or in, as you, what you were describing, an experience trust, right? This bo larger body of experience where we all get to contribute, moving towards this ultimate, you know, whatever you would call it, truth or, you know, convergence. But all this was a precursor. All of it was to ask, if we look at the lineage of where we came from, where do you think your sense of humor came from? My sense of humor? Yeah. Well, it comes a couple of ways. Uh, one thing is uh, I grew up in South Louisiana, and so that certainly helped. Your gregarious family? Oh, very. Storytellers? Very gregarious family. And then yeah. uh, beyond that, studying physics, you hang out with a bunch of physicists, whatever they're into. Mm -hmm. They always have weird sense of humor. If they're really good at what they're doing, they have a great sense of humor. It's extremely weird, extremely <laughs> weird. And then yogis. Yogis have great sense of humor. If you're really accomplished in yoga, you will ultimately have a good sense of humor. And if you teach, you better have a good sense of humor. Sure. I mean, I know some stick in the muds, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, some people have special gifts. Yeah. Laughter is not one of them. But, I, you know, I think about we all get to make a choice as teachers. Uh, I, I could just teach, you know, I'm, I have a pretty good memory for things you say and things you taught. So I could totally teach Cutting Edge Robert circa 2006 or 1997. I could teach those classes and those could be like the foundation of which everything else we then do. And then your inventions are like the that's just what we teach. We just hand on that knowledge like a book. I remember I had two experiences when I was in my early 20s. I just had Egon, and we were hanging out in this mom's group, and there was this woman who was so much older. She was like 33. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like a very old lady, and she always had like, she was really quick. And every time you'd say something, she'd just write on it, something snarky, something silly. And I remember it wasn't the quality of her jokes. I Give me enough time, and I could come up with a call. It was just how lightning fast. She was. And it occurred to me like, oh, give me another decade of practice as an adult because <laughs> I've only been an adult a couple of years here. <laughs> I think I can I think I can get there. I mean, of course, early on studying with you, we just stand out in the parking lot. And yeah. I, you know, I felt like I could hold my own, but holding my own with you was always like one joke in and then you'd tell four in a row and then I'd get one joke in, and then you'd tell four in a row. <laughs> And so, okay, we're, I, I stand at the front of the room and I, who do I want to be? I could be lots of people. I could be the guy that is married to my wife. I could be the guy that's best friends with my buddy over here. I could be the guy that wore a dress shirt to get that job and <laughs> to get that job. I could be, you know, super pure, holy yogi who's never sinned in his life <laughs> and, and speaks from perfection on high. You, there's always a choice there. And, you know, most people would describe this as authenticity. I just say work, working with you always set me and I hope everybody else who's teaches from you sort of empowering them to teach free to be as much of yourself as you want absolutely you know if you're a silly person now you get to be silly at the front of the room certainly and there are points where you're just not silly because 
whoever's in the room needs something else. Mm -hmm. So the, the way I always end up describing that, that kind of thing, the teaching, is, okay, we show up in the middle of eternity. All of a sudden, there are these other people on the outside, and they come with a sore ankle or an injured knee, and... I walk in the room and maybe I don't have those injuries. But if I'm at all sensitive to the person that's in front of me, then that's knowledge. That's right in front of me. And I don't have to have the injury to question whatever's going on and find a solution to whatever's going on. Because there has to be some empathy with the people around you. You're needed for something and that need teaches you something. And so now, you know, how did I become a good teacher? By people asking me questions. They constantly asked questions and drew my attention. It's like, you know, doing some kind of uh, Grand Prix race across France or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it just moves you all kinds of ways. You can go all the way around the world, meet all these people, hear about problems you, you never knew. Someone is a refugee from some war-torn uh, zone, and you get to talk to them, and you think, there's no way on earth I can help this person. And they show up in the middle of your class, and by the end of the class, they've resolved some of the gut pain, quite literally physical gut pain, that was related to the emotion. And what did I do? I just taught a class from my heart. And it's like the heart is the most sensitive part of you. You can feel the most exquisite pain, and you can feel the most beautiful things just by moving from your heart. The tongue is halfway between the heart and the head, depending on what you're doing in your head. <laughs> <laughs> the outcome could be drastically bad or beautiful. And so life has just taken me. My bacterial development has taken an unusual course unique for from anyone else. You know, you don't you don't choose. It's like the conditions on the outside determine how something goes viral, whether it's an actual virus or a videotape or a podcast. That's all gorgeous stuff. Perspective gives gratitude. And the perspective I often come back to that I'll talk about is in either of the world wars, early 20th century, all these people, mostly civilians, but just thinking of the soldiers that particularly were like the first world war where it was for nothing, over nothing. And it was just every bit of it a tragedy. Yes. Every single one of those human beings that died would give anything for our worst day. Okay, so if I just remember that, it's not, hey, be positive, because life isn't always positive. No. <laughs> and I think that... It's not always desirable. <laughs> yeah. Would you say that that kind of gratitude for the fact that you're here, like you made it, you know, however that happened, uh, you as this particular you at this particular time, be way worse if you were born in southern Sudan uh, in terms of your ability to just have a functional body and have the space to help other human beings... Is that why you have a studio, a teacher training, like all the stuff that you like actually create in the world? I still have a studio. At one point, um, about 10 or 12 years ago, I was not going to have a studio. You know, I was just going to travel around and teach wherever I taught, and it didn't work out that way. A lot of people were like, you know, would you please have a studio? And foolishly, I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it opens you up to a lot of work, but... You know, whatever direction you go, you're going you're to learn something as a result. Are you I, still are you still ambivalent about no, having a studio? No, I'm, I'm not. I just do whatever. Because if I'm ambivalent, then I can't do what I'm doing well. And then whatever potential tragedies that could occur in the context of the studio would be far worse. So, no, you know, when, whenever I'm doing something, I'm, I'm 100% into it. If you're, a, and, and, and this comes from something deep inside me, uh, if you're out on a battlefield in ancient Greece or India or wherever, you know, you're in the times of the Mahapalata or something like this, and you're fighting on the ground and you were born, and they say, okay, you're a caste, you're supposed to be a warrior, you're supposed to be God and, and do whatever it is you're doing. And you would say that... Your karma brought you to that point, if you believe in that sort of thing. And even if you don't, there's still the laws of physics, and they're going to drive you a given way. <laughs> As we look at the battlefield in front of us on a given day, your attention is always drawn to whatever is ne necessary to either take care of a problem for someone else or to take care of a problem 
for yourself. And hopefully those two are compatible and we try to resolve them so that both people come out well. And the stakes are high. Yeah, and the stakes are definitely <laughs> high. So when you first go out, if you're as a teacher, and let's just pretend warrior teacher is the same thing, as you go out, uh, you're afraid of getting hurt. And so you go out with tremendous ferocity, maybe more ferocity than you need to. A lot of people went out after studying with Iyengar, and they were hurting other people because he was ferocious in a certain way, but he was intelligently ferocious. He sure. didn't, it wasn't random. So, okay, so this goes out. So you have a young warrior, they go out, they're ferocious. They can get hurt, and other people can as well. But then you're fighting all day long and you get tired and you start thinking, oh, well, if I'm going to make it through the afternoon, this was a tough morning, but if I want to make it through the afternoon, I can't be reacting. I can't be upset about my best friend that just died next to me. All the people in your life, their eyes are going to pass away, you know, and your eyes are going to pass away. So... Every life around you is gorgeous. Beautiful flower that you give to someone is dead perhaps the next day, and then you have to give them another one. So whatever is there in front of you, you appreciate. You appreciate completely. And life goes on. You get to the afternoon. You're fighting all afternoon. In the morning, somebody's going to cut you, and what do you do? You do something to stop them from doing that. Maybe you kill them. Okay, this is a war now. Okay, right. this is a war with swords and spirits and all oh, spirits and all that kind of stuff. Or there, whatever political force is behind. And you're a kid. And you're just going out and you're fighting. Well, it goes on. You're mature. You get to the end of the day and you don't kill them. Maybe you just look for a way to incapacitate them a little bit and be able to get away from that particular point to go to the next point that's going to be challenging for you. And then years go by and you become very experienced and you're not afraid anymore. And you hear the sounds of battle and you hear all the screams and you hear all the stuff that goes on and you're not afraid. In fact, it just makes you focus. That's all. That's all it does. There's a day that comes and you know you're not going to survive. You know it. And it's the best day. And I'll tell you why it's the best day. Because you're no longer a pawn of anything. You're putting all of your life forward in that particular moment. And if you don't survive, it's okay. Because you know you're going you're gonna to return a different way. And if you can help somebody who's in the same position, even though they're attacking you, if you can help them, you'll help them. It becomes an entirely different way of living. Everything's beautiful. There are no enemies. That's where I teach from. Like it's the last day of my life. That's how I teach. You have to put your whole heart into it. It's not that someone is, quote, friend, enemy, agreeing, disagreeing. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. You do the best thing that you can at that particular point, recognizing that the stakes are high for the person across from you just as much as for you. And so you give them the best that you have. And every once in a while, you have some beautiful young student that will come on and say something that, my God, why didn't I think of that? I'm grateful to be alive. I don't even recognize sometimes. I look at the physical form in the mirror in the morning. Who is that? Is that me? I mean, I recognize that person. I've watched them. I've listened to their thoughts. But is that who I am? And you start feeling something much more beautiful inside. I used to do two or three hours of practice early mornings, and I would really enjoy it. And I would just pop out of sleep and I'd start doing practices. And what do you do? What do you pay attention to? It's like, oh, you know, what's not optimal? What can I do that makes it optimal? And you learn something. At a certain point, you've become the pains or discomfort that might exist become less important. Stars at night are big and bright deep in the heart of Texas. Hey guys, it's pun time. It's a one, two, three. It's a pun for me. me you. It's really for you. We should like have like a word. We should have a themed word like today's puns brought to you by pins. How do you write the tale of captive horses? Hmm. With a pen. What? With a pen. Captive horses. Oh. What do you yell at Lum when he keeps asking you what does he write his dissertation with? Uh, his dissertation on clocks with. <laughs> what? A pen, you Lum! <laughs> Head shake. <laughs>
Uh, what kind of what kind of herb is most likely to reach nirvana? What? Enlightenment. It's not a pin joke. Oh. What kind of pin can you drink water from on a hot day? I know this one. What is it? A fountain pin. A water fountain pin. <laughs> Oh, Ooh, okay. <laughs> what kind of pen would little kids use to point at dude scratches? Ballpoint pen? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've got a couple chuckles out of you. So silly. <laughs> okay. What kind of writing instrument is most likely to bring you the most serenity? Mm -hmm. Lapis. <laughs> That's pencil blue. in Spanish. Oh, that was blue in Spanish. A azul. Of all the things you can write with, which one smells the worst? Hmm. Stink. <laughs> <laughs> Stink ink. What kind of pen has the most cacao? Fountain pens, of course, because of all the nibs. <laughs> cacao nibs. This is my favorite. This should be saved for another podcast. All right. Here's this. Okay. One. What do you call a chocolate cow? What? A cacao cow. A cacao cow. What do you call the end of their udders? Huh. Nibbles. <laughs> cacao nibbles. <laughs> cacao nibbles. Okay. Uh, that joke was not cacao is a nut. Cacao is a nut? Yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> you did not know that? <laughs> <laughs> I can see where, you, see where you're going there. I can see that's actually a pretty good joke. What kind of fountain pen can you never remember the second name of? Mont blank. It's pronounced Montblanc. 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 And why is it pronounced Montblanc? It's German. In the absence of people swinging swords and clubs at your head, we have quad sensation. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and you would swear that it was clubs and swords. A hundred percent. Some people run out of the room. <laughs> Everybody has their own perspective. The way we define perspective in a way that helps people get it and what we're trying to do developing empathy for other human beings is we imagine perspective as the place where you stand right. like a mountaintop. So where Robert is sitting here across the table from me, he can see what's behind me and where I'm sitting across the table from Robert, I can see what's behind him. Neither of us can see what the other can and so then it demands the question, what's true? Which one is the correct perspective? The question's phrased like that. It's obviously well, neither. Each gives you a different perspective. And if so, what if I could go sit over there on your side of the table and you go sit on mine and now we can actually have my original perspective and your perspective? That's empathy. I imagine what it's like yeah. to be you. You're at the top of a mountain and at the top of a mountain, you see a lot more than if you were in the valley, except your perspective is completely dictated by where that mountain is. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so what we do in our practice, the person who comes in with the knee injury that you've never had or the weird leaky gut thing, I can do that work having, once I've been asked the question, realize I don't actually know what it's like to be you. I can go get over there on your mountaintop. And now we're collectors of mountaintops in this practice. But not everybody's funny. Not everybody's poetic. Not everybody's interesting or charismatic or, right? Everybody has, the way Andrea put it, is that we're all put together differently. So we're, we're walking into the conversation differently. We can work on stuff. We can always develop and grow and change and augment this or mutate that. But our starting place is always different. You can see that in uh, people's aesthetic, what they gravitate to. So I hope everybody listening to this can hear that Robert's aesthetic is poetic. You are a poet. You are drawn to not necessarily sweeping portraits of grand beauty, but more like, like the most important things are the small, precious. Like beauty is so important for you. The experience of beauty, actually seeing it, right? Some people don't know you're a visual artist. The taste of it in your life. When you're at the front of the room teaching, that is one of the paintbrushes you go to. Sort of painting pictures, trying to connect people to the poignance of actually experiencing what's beautiful in life. There's lots of things you can experience in life, and not everybody cares about beauty, except you do. <laughs> I do. What's, it, what's the deal about hitting balls, you know? Like it's, football, kicking a football, it's, hitting it's, a golf It's ball. all about relocating the ball. I, yeah. It's not, it's, you don't it's have to like, hit it or kick yeah. it, it's just relocation. Travel, I mean, you travel. <laughs> don't kick someone else in that door. I don't know. It's, Robert, it's it weird. takes a lot of balls to live that way. It so does, just, it's true, absolutely. And I've had a ball doing it, but. You've kind of gone bald. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> I have, totally. <laughs> well, not completely, but I can perceive 
antithesis of where I am now. Yes, that's right. It, it, it used to be more hairy. Now it's, yeah, it's, it's very it's, hairy. It's clarified. It yeah. <laughs> Science is not a monolith. It's you know the difference right. between you know how do you study geologic history versus the stars, it's different kinds of ways you can test stuff. I can't take a sample of Jupiter, my personally, but or of a star, uh, but I can extrapolate from, I, I can test stuff and then, as you said, iterate on what's past the test. And so my favorite description of a scientist is somebody who sp- dedicates their life trying to dispro- disprove their favorite idea. Because that's what a good test does. A good test absolutely. that can't prove it true, but it can absolutely prove it false. <laughs> <laughs> just sort of reflecting on just how you're describing your journey. It, you're obviously seeking the truth, but yes. of all the people that I know, your willingness to, it's like, hey, there's this teacher I found. I didn't know. I mean, it's like, oh, this guy in the Himalayas. Let's do that. Oh, this, this lady, Anna Forrest. Oh, there's this NBC, oh, this, uh, NLP. I'll drive to California it's all night. Oh, I heard that this lady who does this one kind of Kung Fu. I'll, how about I drive there? Oh, you know what? You know what I need? I need to start a whole new discipline. <laughs> <laughs> and for somebody who, in seeking the truth, has had almost no ego about your particular theory you're trying to prove right. Rather, it's almost like you're a gourmet who just loves tasting stuff. And in the tasting of it, trying to find the truth of the experience. Sound and, accurate? And, and I tell you where it led me. If you're a very good scientist, not really attached to a particular theory, but you're always looking for what's true, right. that helps out a lot. On the other hand, if you're not a mystic and pursuing things that seem very implausible to the scientific part of you, if you're not willing to go there either, because the propositions that might be proposed by some kind of mystical idea might be the next step in the, in the science. Everyone does what they have a reason to believe, right? Right. And if we look at your energetic journey, both how you describe it, language it, you do not interface with the world the way you did in the 80s. No. And uh, so that is always growing. You know, when I think about how we, do, I become a famous yogi. <laughs> Uh, there's, Give up that idea. Well, so, I mean, I never cared about that, but yeah. it's an interesting question. No, I, at I, least, I, I, I know you would because <laughs> because you're way too real to, to get into that kind of thing. And, but there's a simple way to do it. If you look at the success of every style, sure. they all have a, the same solution, which is come up with a, a sequence and a perspective that works okay, and then that's that. <laughs> and if you just create a thing like Bikram or power yoga, uh, or even Ashtanga, here's the thing. And then that's that. And there's no, there is no evolution or iteration. It is a thing. And now I can pass it to you as a fully formed true thing. And if you're really lucky, I'll teach you the seventh series uh, out of a little paper journal that, you know, and then really it's actually about a god Zenu that you meet later on in this, but we just don't talk about that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and to me, the, I think the, the beauty of the experience of studying with you is that you always share everything all the time. Like there's no secret. There's no like level two. There is no agenda behind what you offer. But there's also no, you know, if you think of snake oil, snake oil is this works for sure. Don't ask for evidence. <laughs> you know, if I could sort of reframe the experience of spending all those years with you it's here's what i know that makes a difference taste it and see yeah and it's there which is very different and it helps to see you know if you think about i heard a a talk on how do you know if you're a good parent like you don't pose as a pure being to your children you're a flawed person (laughs) and because you're kind of messed up they're kind of free to be however they need to be you never you never posed as a finished product you were always loath to brand anything or to systematize anything. And so when people knew, you know, authenticity, genuineness, all that stuff, they, that's obvious, but also in the product, in the class, in the teaching, everyone has to learn themselves anyway. If you're yes. if somebody's playing piano, you can't make them move that index finger. Everyone who's ever moved their index fingers had to figure out how to move their fucking index finger themselves from the inside and so you're at the front of the room and you're just you're giving people this experience without trying to prove something yeah because uh, if you're going to move a given index finger where are you moving it from are you moving it from a place of wanting to impress someone else that's, or that's the middle moving? finger yeah that, well, <laughs> that's frequently yeah. uh it's very expressive but <laughs> But you're you're always trying to to find the place from which you move. 
And if you move from that place long enough, that place deep inside long enough, then everything else begins to relax outside. It's very hard for people sometimes to believe that moving from a very genuine place inside, from what I, I would always call the, I, I mentioned this before, that when, when, I was, when I was very young in high school, I was, started working with some artists. I mean, this is on the point. Uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, that somebody might miss this. Well, my standards but. for you being on the point are always low, so it's all good. <laughs> it's just like this. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, so, you're free. You're, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm definitely free. <laughs> Not quite as free as I wanted, but I'm I'm working on it. Yeah. So, so I w- and and that's the point. The point is, you have to be free because if you're not, you'll never find who you are. You never will. You'll become a cheap imitation of somebody else. And then you'll try and pass that on to someone else. I mean, I respect tradition. And there are some really beautiful things that I've learned within tradition. But I've also been told by people who are protectors of tradition that do whatever you do because no one can do it the way you do. So there's no one else here that can do that. And that's what I would tell everyone else. There was, um, I was in this little wooden house in South Louisiana in high school, and there were a bunch of graduate students, and speaking, speaking of being around old people. <laughs> so I was around a bunch of graduate <laughs> students in the art school at, you know, at the university in my hometown. And we do things like they have a bone in front of you, and they say, okay, look at the bone and draw a picture of, of the bone holding this pencil in some unusual way, but don't look at your hand. Just look at the bone and move your hand like the bone, the shape of the bone. And it was very interesting that there was some representation, even though it wasn't completely accurate, but it was some representation of whatever object you were looking at that showed up on the paper. And the more you concentrated, the more you were absolutely in the present moment, the better it got. And then after a while, you could look at something and draw something, and it held the energy of whatever that was. And so I I spent time, they were playing Indian ragas, I mean, in South Louisiana. I had never heard an Indian raga until I got together with those kids. So, you know, so you're out there, it's hot, it's in the summer. You've got screened area and you're just drawing in the afternoon every once in a while, once a week or twice a week, something like this. They were trying to find their ultimate expression of graphic arts, visual art. They said, I heard of someone who actually found their thing. And the tragic thing about finding your thing and just then you just reproduce it. And the point is, why would you restrict yourself? You can't just run away from it all. Uh, you can't just patch it all up. You can't just hide from it. As soon as you begin to believe in the fear that's in the future, because, okay, we've got two directions. I can have regret about things that have happened before, okay, or I can have some discomfort about things that are coming up. Anxiety. Well, if I, if I let the fear become a wall, then I'm not going to progress. If you're afraid to evolve, if you're not going to, like, let go of whatever has passed by, you're, you're not going to move forward. You're going you're gonna to build a wall of fear, and you're going to stop dead in your tracks, and you're dead. You're in a coffin already, and you set it. You set the lid on your coffin. So you can't, you can't do that. At a certain point, you're going to have to adapt. You can't just depend on everybody else to do that kind of thing. And if nothing else, I mean, that's some of what I want to... I want to teach you, okay, here are some good ideas. Here are some fundamental uh, physics, science, so on. You're the number one guinea pig. It's always the case. You're going to be the number one guinea pig because, okay, it's like you decided to go into that relationship. Well, you're going to understand something about your psychology and the other person, necessarily, because you did. Yeah. But if you don't, you'll never learn anything, and you'll just be, okay, you, you'll be afraid and locked in your house for the rest of your life, and you'll die there. And you have to let go of the past because if you don't let go of the past, you won't look to the future. Uh, some kind of videotape of some policeman chasing someone who just robbed a bank and so on and he was running down this boulevard and there were a bunch of palm trees and he kept looking back at the policeman he kept running into the trees (laughs) and and the policeman said well you know i would have caught the guy but i was laughing so So, so don't so, look back yeah just like let go you're here in the moment do the moment 
don't fear the future. Don't regret the past. Just do now. And then you have some, some really good chances at that point. You know, if it's the last day of your life in this battle and you know you're not going to survive, you're absolutely free at that particular point. And chances are you'll survive only because you're so appreciative of the life in this moment, regardless of the pain, regardless of anything else. You couldn't even have the pain if you didn't have a life. And whoever's there, they're precious. Whoever's there, they're going to be gone someday. Don't miss them now. It's so important. I'm really passionate about it. Yeah, the best case is you actually get to be around long enough to see everyone you love dying. That's the best case. If you are not going to appreciate it, for me it always feels like I'm uh, spitting on the graves of every person who died before they wanted to. I don't owe them anything, but it feels ungrateful. I did this, I might have told you about this, I, my 20s was obsessed with nuclear holocaust. Mm -hmm. no. it's the second biggest port in the country, you yeah. know, it's a big oil producer, okay, Houston's totally a target. Dirty bomb, you know, it's pre-9-11. We're totally a target. Uh, if a hydrogen bomb goes off in Houston, it'll melt glass in Austin. So I won't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely the case. So, but what if like a, a smaller nuclear bomb, Hiroshima size, where you see it, you see the light before you get the impact and you might survive the impact, but you probably won't survive what then comes next. And I just played that out in my mind. Okay, I'm, I see the light. And at the time I was sitting at, do you remember Gosha, Alaska? Yeah. <laughs> so I was sitting with Gosha, Alaska at Nitnoy on Fannin. Oh my gosh, I wish that was still around. <laughs> and I was looking out the window towards Pasadena, where it would have exploded. <laughs> And I'm imagining the light, and I'm imagining I have a few seconds before the shockwave of death. And Egon was just born, so mm. I'm, you know he's a few months old. And in my imagination, my last thought was, but wait, as I reached out for my wife and child. And I was struck by how utterly ungrateful that was, that that would be my last thought. Like, I wasn't guaranteed this life, just as you used to say, I'm not guaranteed another breath. And yet I'm here, I just had good Thai food, I have a friend, I like got introduced to yoga, I got to, I got to hug my baby once, which not everybody can say. And my last thought was, that wasn't enough, give me some... <laughs> <laughs> I like the voice. <coughs> I mean, that's kind of, it was just so <laughs> like. a good voice. I got one of those. <laughs> For sure. And actually made a commitment. Who knows what you'll think when you die. Probably mm -hmm. something embarrassing, but. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> but I made the commitment like, okay, I'm going to at the very least give it a shot to live my life. So that's not the last thought I have when I check out. Growing up at Dugas, you always see the worst. Every, every, every time I've ever opened the door to my house, I'm reasonably confident that there's somebody there with some kind of firearm to murder me. And so I always check and then there's not there and I'm pleasantly surprised. And so that's, okay. you grow up as a somewhere between a psychopath and a nervous wreck of, of uh, paranoia. I know that the most dangerous thing I do every day is drive in the city of Houston. And I know the most dangerous thing my wife does is drive in the city of Houston. So when Andrea has to drive somewhere, the highest likelihood of any of us dying is today while she drives. <laughs> right? And I'm pretty safe as a making my coffee. I, you know, I'm probably not going to poke myself in the eye with a fountain pen. Driving in Houston is deadly. And so every time I ever look at her when she leaves, I always kiss her before she goes and I always take her in. And so what for most people seem as like a morbid act, which it seems on the outside is this, I'm afraid of the future. I'm living in anxiety about some horrible potential future. For me, I'm actually living in the reality that this will happen at some point, best case. Yeah. One of us, we, we will get the news. There will be a cancer or there will be a sudden death. If we're really lucky, one of us will be conscious enough to experience that for the other. The universe doesn't owe us anything. <laughs> and so this could be it. That, not, that certainty has only given me more verve and zest for tasting the present moment. Absolutely. And appreciating what I do have. And so I really... You know, I've talked about the poetry project I did for Andrea. You were there on the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the engagement party. She wrote me a song. Like the big thing I got out of that was for three months, I practiced remembering why I loved her. Well, every day I practice, I practice experiencing her <laughs> and actually not missing her. I don't get, I don't miss her. Obviously we're both romantics and poets. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Which is why we're drawn to the same stuff. The one thing I did want to sort of maybe to wrap it up is mm -hmm. our first of obviously many conversations. Years ago, I said, hey, you, Robert, you need a book. And I was like the 40th person who said that to you. And then you said, all right, here you go. And he gave me the printout of like <laughs> all your various <laughs> workshops. And, and at the time I was not, I was, I had not been born as a writer. Mm -hmm. And to be a writer, you have to be an editor. So I, I didn't have the skills of editing at that point. Too big a project for 
dumb Andrew at that point. Now I could actually, I'd be, I'm a fucking good editor. You give me all that shit. I can whip it up into shape. But that did, that was also very encouraging to me knowing that at some point Robert's going to need to fucking <laughs> sit down <laughs> And either start from scratch mm-hmm. or create some kind of structure in which to plug in these various ideas and then just do the writing to fill it in sure. for his book. But Robert's going to have to do that. I can't sure. <laughs> do that. And so th- th- and then after me, between then and now, has been 40 other people that have said that exact same thing to you and had that, uh, you know, some kind of similar experience. But what has, cha- <laughs> <God>. <laughs> what has, what has changed, what has changed is you, for the first time since I've known you, actually begun to yourself document what it yeah. is you teach. Would you say that, uh, to paraphrase a, a quote from Carl Sagan that's on there that I put in my manual, his definition of science, it's just knowledge and it's the willingness to withhold belief until a good reason presents itself and so to systematize and to test, document and systematize everything you know. And literally, he, this is a, from a radio interview on Science Friday from the 90s. I almost got an accident. I heard it in the car, like mm-hmm. swerving, pulling over, like trying to like, write it down <laughs> and then like go find it online. One of the best definitions of science I've ever heard, but also was the foundation for my course. There's stuff that I do that works. What is actually happening that has it work? And okay, is there a way I can systematize it? That is this open-ended thing where if you're studying it, it's not the truth you now repeat as the as the fake facsimile, aka the temporary bogus Andrew. You're you teaching teaching the work you have hard won through this thinking, but it's standing on the shoulders of Robert and then standing on the shoulders of the work I did. Uh, how much are you? So you're documenting now, but how much are you doing the structural systemization like? Whether it's a book or not, you know, it's, with the teacher training, with the courses, uh, with what, them. What's happening is we're doing all these Zoom lectures that organizes things. And the way that I, the way I work is neural network is continually updating. So if I could ever download my neural network, <laughs> you would have an AI yoga teacher. And we're getting close to doing Amen. that kind of thing. So yeah. it may not be Microsoft Word. It may be, I don't know, I go talk to Elon Musk and... He downloads me into some system. It's definitely a, a nonlinear process, so you can't you can't do it the usual way. Right. So that means you would take an object oriented database and a relational database and put them together, and then you could take videotape, little tiny clips of uh, video and pictures, and verbalize instruction relative to something, comments on joints, and you let the AI cross correlate all this, and you find patterns you never found before so directionally that's where i like to go as i started to say when i teach i'll take all that i have and create a structure for that particular class many of the elements will show up in one of these classes it's like a hologram of some object uh, within the hologram every point has some information about the whole uh, that's what's happening with the videotapes i honestly think that we'll get to a point where we can take all that kind of information downloaded into something, I don't know what, in that you can query the system and get answers to certain kinds of questions that I can solve some because I I carry all that stuff inside me. I think there's a way to simplify the system, but as soon as you simplify it, it's not going to get to the same place that I'd like to go. But it's still um. It's still a place to start yeah. for people. You know, we can't shock you put our way around every class. <laughs> no. but And there's no telling what will happen. <laughs> if you do, there's no telling. It's like, oh, my goodness. Oops, um, sorry about that. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're clearing out all the emotional stuff for the last, you know, thousand lifetimes. And uh, yes, you're laughing a lot. And no, it's not helpful. <laughs> I mean, for the rest of creation. It's like you're, you're blissful, but we're not getting new information here. Right. Language is a stand-in. It is. It's the map, not the territory. And it, right. with what we did in the course, is just to be willing to define every term as much as possible, and know that that definition is only a launchpad for the experience. Right. But that has been super empowering for people to replicate. There's two ways you can say, as a teacher of teachers, how are you successful? Do your teachers teach exactly like you? <laughs> And people love them. No. Okay, well, then you failed. <laughs> do your teacher, do every one of your teachers teach differently from you and from themselves? And people love them. Yes, that's success. There's lots of other ways to fail. 
<laughs> as a teacher of teachers, Probably. which is what most teacher trainings do. You know, I was very loath to call what I do a style. Uh, the only, the literally only reason we did it is because three years before we started the studio, we started the teacher training. People are hounding me to do teacher training. All right, I'll do a teacher training. After the third course, people were like, we need to know what we are now. <laughs> <laughs> what what when we teach the stuff you taught us what the fuck is that like we need a name and i was ve- i was dead set against having a style intellectually we had already come up with this name for a domain for the business uh, and so we just it make it sort of made sense it was sort of this easy shoe in but even then before we had the teacher training and really before we had the studio it was not clear that if i teach you everything i know and you go fil- you know you filter that through your experience and all the stuff and your preferences and your aesthetic and then you stand in the front of the room with all of your weird communication quirks and leadership issues and <laughs> fears and problems <laughs> with prosody and you know whatever will it translate we did this um, organizational guy i might have told you about this he totally obvious nothing special strategy for organizing your life he says every day you should only you should have t- at most three things you're out to accomplish only three things on your to-do list and then in, during your week you have three bigger things that every individual day's three things sort of direct towards but no more than three things in a week and then a month you should have three even bigger things that all those smaller goals are sort of aiming towards then you got short term you know in months medium term and some number of years long term 20 years all obvious. But for some reason, when he said, and you should have three lifetime t- things you're working on. When he said that, something clicked. I was like, okay, I'll play. I'll play that game. And so you worked backwards. Okay, we asked the question, what's your life for? All right, let's just boil it down to three things. <laughs> this is it. This is what you do every day to have these three things happen, which of course targets give you direction. And then they give you direction to shoot and then they test how good you are at hitting it. All right, so that, okay, I got three big targets. Uh, no yoga things made my lifetime. And then 20 year, one yoga thing made my lifetime. And it was to impact the lives of a million people who don't know my name. And this was pretty early on in the teacher training, maybe like the first year of the teacher training. Mm-hmm. And so that's the goal, right? People love this teacher's class, but they don't, they've never been in my class. For them, Yoga Better is Lizzie Bosell or Andrea or whoever, right? Larry. They, when they think of the Yoga Better logo or whatever, or the language, I'm not involved at all. And if they come to my class, they might like my class, but they're like, oh, you sound like Larry. <laughs> that's, in their mind, there's, there's a, like a little bit of that. Sure. And so that's the test, you know, when we're thinking about if I'm If I'm teaching, it has to be, it has to exist without me. Right. And if I'm going to teach you to teach, you have to teach without fucking me. <laughs> right. Sure. So how replicatable is it? And it was not clear that it that the style would work without me. We tested it, and thankfully, whew, it it is very replicatable. But we only got there by defining terms. Right. For instance, most people are afraid of goals. Goals for us are just targets. If you're thinking about being a yoga teacher, you probably probably have some issues with organization and <laughs> commitment. <laughs> And so on our very first Saturday, one of the first things we define is commitment. Mm -hmm. What is commitment? And now, even though it's only pointing to the experience of devoting yourself to a thing, regardless of how you feel, it's a hook we can hang everything. The whole rest of the course is hung on commitments. I give you two pages of commitments and then you failed the whole course and we talk about why you failed with your commitments. But it's it's a word we can now use to lift heavy objects and handle. I think about you systematizing everything you're trying to do. It can't be the Shakti pot. Yeah, data transfer, but you can. I mean, if you if you went and this is my fantasy of organizing your shit again. <laughs> okay, okay, hey, I'm in but, for it. But you know, it's I. I bet if you, I mean, it's just like less than 500 terms. Way less than 500. Now those are just tags in the spreadsheet, and every video has less than 15 tags. That is, you can do that in any number of organizational softwares. The obnoxious thing that you have now seen dealing with all the technical BS of streaming and <laughs> is it just it's your part-time gig is like sound engineer, audio visual, <laughs> key grip. <laughs> You're your own IT guy when shit goes wrong. And with the website, we have thousands of videos now on this website, making them searchable, making them findable was a fun challenge and it's incomplete but it is you know if you click on balance well i had to individually go through and label those things but it's like now it's it's done and so it's it's rough like with the teacher training i give you a practice to do six days a week they just got their 
practice video three, which is you have to design your own from videos on the website. Videos you've never seen. You can't listen to the audio, so you can't hear how I teach it. You just have to look at the positions and you come up with 50 minutes of a class on your own just from the visuals. And then next you know, Saturday in like three weeks, they teach that. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the practice videos I give them never have audio. So they, they have to understand what's happening. And I'm wearing all black in a dimly lit room like yeah, that's that's life, man. If you can't tell what, <laughs> which one of my legs is for, you're not you're not going to do well in a yoga class. <laughs> but it's a it's all structures for them to. It's a container to have the experience. It's the sign that directs them to the thing, rather than ever know ever having a delusion that the sign is the thing. The sign to Berlin is not Berlin. Absolutely, not. that's pretty cool. The the power of people like you're a poet, and what is poetry? Poetry is language distilled. Where there's kind of always mystery, like not everybody knows what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> like you, you, you need a few more sentences to describe what you just said. It's like, nope, it's a poem. Sorry. You you write in poetry. Language is important to you, both in punnery and in metaphor. To me, the best part of doing a teacher training was I just from like a, a maniacal despot perspective is I defined like 300 words for the course. So I literally put the definition and I just made up a definition of everything. My, the definition of commitment is my definition. <laughs> I did not look it up. Like, <laughs> here's what here's what commitment means for our purposes. <laughs> That's good. For all of it. Postures, strengths, balance, everything. And the challenge of actually defining it is, okay, I'm taking a simplification and abstraction and I'm using more simplifications and abstraction to clarify it just a little bit. And now we're all on the same page. So when I say empathy... Everybody in this room knows what the hell I'm talking about. You in this sort of tagging system, that's all it really needs is just a few hundred words to dumb it down for the people, the next generation of people in their 20s coming up who are going to be really facile with learning from a computer as much as sitting in, in a room for a year, four times. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the definition of communication from Bell Laboratories. Reduction of uncertainties. Production of uncertainty. Right. <laughs> that's all. And that's all you can you can ever do. All the conflicts that occur in the world are often based on there has not been enough reduction of uncertainty. That's it. Any other questions? No, I think uh, about the only thing. The reason I call Perlia Perlia is because it's uh, the lowest energetic state that can exist. In other words, there's no manifest reality. And so there's always a baseline against which you measure everything. Where does it go from there? Well, put fairly simply, you start giving people little bits and pieces, but you're not sure how it's all interconnected. But you give them experience in the class of how it's interconnected. So they finish a given pose and they sit in a reference position to find out how do they feel relative to the reference pose. And you keep the reference pose through the class. And at a certain point, they understand relationships because they always had a baseline against which they measured it, which is the reference pose, not necessarily per lie per se. Right. And so at a certain certain point, they have language about what their experience was, but it's their language based on their experience. So I'll tell them, okay, we did this pose. We're going to go back into this seated pose and notice what uh, what you were feeling. And it's like, don't evaluate it. Just feel it. The words will come out. And what do the words come out from? Who they really are. So they can't even bias it. It's going to show up that way. And then, you know, flower blooms at some point. And then it's like, wow. It's more beautiful than I thought. This and every conversation was destined to end with an image of a flower. <laughs> it always does. It has to end with it. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. That was really fun. Yeah, brother. They call him obsessed, give him time to be best. He'll always learn something new. He puts the two into God. Some of you have been with me long enough to know that one of my most recent obsessions is, I can fix that. Yep. If something's broke, I just have the thought and I say it out loud, I can fix that. And I've been fixing a lot of stuff. The list is quite long over the last year. And so I'm finding myself at Guitar Center, which in the good old days, I would have hated Guitar Center. Guitar Center was for sellouts. find myself playing electric basses and there's these Fender Jazz electric basses and they all have frets. And, you know, I used to play a Fender Jazz electric bass without frets, a fretless, a fretless, fender, a fretless fender. I still have it, but... Every single time I played a gig with it, I would slam it on the ground like a rock and roll star. And I would try to break it. The very last gig I ever played, I succeeded. 
<laughs> right. I broke the body and I threw it on the ground and I stomped on it. I broke off one of the pickups and all the knobs and it was very rock and roll and totally not worth it. Super, super dumb. But I didn't give it away. I kept it. I don't know if you've ever seen the electronics for an electric guitar. It's a mess in there. And if you don't know soldering or electronics, it, your brain sort of switches off. So I took it to a place here in town. They said 600 bucks to fix it. It was a $600 bass. So I basically knew that I wasn't going to have a bass. So I let it go. Fast forward a few, you know, decades, literally decades. And for some reason, it just sat on the back porch. I didn't even put it in the attic, which means every time it floods, submerged to some degree in water, it's sitting upright. So, that, But the butt is like getting wet every time it ever floods. I just had this thought, like, I wonder how that bass is doing. I go get it expecting that out of this case is going to be dust. And lo and behold, it looks pretty darn good. And so I had this idea, I can fix that. So $200 later with all the parts, I solder all the electronics, install two new pickups, all new knobs, electronics, wiring, a new bridge, new strings, uh, all new hardware on the head as well. And I mean, the truth is it plays better than it did when I was in high school. As I sort of was doing this work, I remembered two things. And this is why I love the process of getting into obsessions. They lead you to weird places. I remembered that my dad, who had no reason to believe in his absolutely insane son, I was such a crazy, ungrateful, crazy person. And I told him, I need an electric bass, dad. It's super important for me. And, uh, and so he goes to this music store that he buys me a $600 bass. He did not need to do that. And he just believed in me. And, he, and I just remember feeling both the sharp beauty beauty of gratitude for his trust in me and the bitter shame of not caring for this thing that he he bought for me when I you know it's not like we had a whole bunch of money back then and I did not take care of this thing and so it felt so good to take care of this 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 sort of physical symbol of my father's love for me, his caring for me, his desire for me to be successful. Even though he had like no clue, <laughs> like he didn't relate to my the music I made with that instrument, but it didn't matter. He supported me. I, just, I felt so crazily grateful and I am a sentimental dorkhead. I love completely giving myself to sentimentality. And in the remembering of this whole thing, I remember that I loved that music store and I couldn't remember the name. I could not for the life of me remember the name of this thing, which then led to this new obsession and this sort of amazing insight into the change of our world. I grew up in a time before the internet where if you didn't know something, that was that. And so you had to go find a book that would tell you where to find the information. <laughs> if you wanted to find the music store that was open in your town, you went through the Yellow Pages. Everybody had the Yellow Pages. And you, every year, got another big old Yellow Pages right on your driveway and then the, maybe like the regional yellow pages for like your neighborhood kind of thing and not everybody was in the yellow pages there were times when there weren't people listed you had to call them to see if they were open and like their hours there were no websites there was no way to find this stuff out and i'm thinking well Okay, 1994, 1994, I can, I mean, surely, I mean, how many Houston, greater Houston area yellow pages were printed? A billion? There's got to be like somewhere uh, yellow pages from 1994. And yes, I did not like scour the world. I did not, I didn't go to a single library. It wasn't this important, but my idea was, okay, this music store has got to be in the 1994 yellow pages. Okay, I search online, I search for collectors, I go to eBay, I have a automatic search that lets me know if any Houston Yellow Pages, any listing Houston Yellow Pages shows up any year, any era, <laughs> right? It's like everything before the internet was erased. If you did a thing before there was a web page, before there was documentation, it's just gone. The thing that documented your existence, the Yellow Pages, we were so quick to get rid of them. Delighted. Just, oh, finally we can rid ourselves. And like, I don't think there's, there's probably not a single person in the city of Houston that has a 1994 Yellow Pages. That's a part of my childhood. I mean, that's, that was a daily thing you interacted with. A thing that taught you how to find things. And you reached out and you interacted with these businesses. And of course, if you're a sentimental like me, it's sad. But also, super annoying, what is the name of this stupid music store? I'm at the Guitar Center, and I'm waiting forever to check out because this guy is talking the ear off of the other cashier. And he brags, he just brings up that, like, I used to work at Mars Music. Ah, uh, the key fits the lock. It turns, it's a little rusty. There it is. Ah, uh, Mars Music. So for any of those fans of you, for any of you guys out in Houston, Texas that remember Mars Music, ah, uh, Mars music. So good. You wouldn't go to Guitar Center. Guitar Center was like the circuit city of, <laughs> or whatever, pejorative. Of course, now that's all there is. There's only a few small music stores here in the city. Oh, man, Mars music. 
the good old days. So be sentimental. Be reminiscent. Dig into your history. Be sad about change and see if you can resurrect little symbols of people's love for you. People have loved you. Some people love you right now, but it's nice to remember. This podcast was produced in Houston, Texas by the world-renowned Sarah Bellum and myself, Andrew Dugan.